Um, I'm Jerry, if I have not met you, and if I know you, hi, online and there. Um, it has been quite a week for me. I'm sure some of you have had doozies of weeks or months. It's not easy out there. And I think coming to church on a Sunday, this is what I thought of this week, it's kind of like going to the chiropractor. It's like a realignment. And sometimes it's like, oh, I'm going to die because he takes your head and cracks it. Do you ever have, if you've ever had that done, I hate it. Um, but welcome to church this morning. Welcome to service. And the things that God teaches me, God bless you. He teaches, then I share it with you. But be prepared. I feel like he wants to realign us all this morning. And here's the thing that when I was praying about that, like ideally when you go to the chiropractor and you get realigned, you don't go back and spend the rest of the week doing what you did before to get out of whack, correct? Ideally, you come up with new ways and new things so that you don't get re disaligned again. So I would encourage you that as a follower of Jesus if you are here and he realigns you. Like let's use the tools that we're going to talk about so that next week it's not like, oh, I got to get a realignment again. You know, make it less. We need to make it less. True for me too. All right. Speaking of weeks. So I'm going to share a little story at the beginning of when we go here. Um, and it happens to be about my mom who is here and she will want to correct me because I do not remember details that well. And I just remember what I think I know. Okay. But I want to tell you a little something, something that happened to her this week, last week, this week, right? Was it this week? Ish. It's been for the last, over the last two weeks. So she has LifeLock. If you don't know what that is, I don't really either, but it protects your computer stuff. That's all I know. Um, she got an annual pres prescription. She got an annual subscri subscription that she paid X amount of dollars for. And then within whatever amount of time it is, she was on Facebook and saw an ad that had the same annual subscription for substantially less money. Who doesn't want that? Call this number. Hello. I just did this and I paid this much, but I'd like to pay this much. Can you fix that for me? Absolutely, ma'am. We will get right on that. Let's talk about some things very nice, nice, nice here. Oh, <laughs> oh good. Oh, do you know that we are actually, can you see that people have already tried to get into your account? We can really fix that. You first need to download a few things so that we can actually stop people from taking from your bank account. <laughs> but when you trust people, you don't know that you're being deceived. That's the whole point of deception. You don't know that you're being deceived, correct? So that proceeds to two hours of just grooming and being nice and, oh my gosh, download the, upload this website onto your phone so we can help you and we can go through things. And what happens when you upload a website, download, whatever it is? They can see your screen and get access to everything. And they did. And some things happen, and she'll never get some of that happenings back. And at the end of that two hours, it had gotten to a place where it was like, oh my gosh, we can trap these people. You just go to another bank, take out X amount of money, substantial amount of money, you put it in a cashier's check, you mail it to Victor, Victor? Some guy in Alabama, guy in Alabama who we can do this sting, and we can catch him, because you're not the only one he does this to. So that's what called fraud. That's called deception. It happens to everyone. If you're sitting here, literally, or if you're there, don't do that. And if someone ever tells you, don't tell anyone. It's like basic 101. Don't tell everyone. I will say this because I think this part's funny. I, I assume I have this part right. They did tell her you cannot tell anyone. You cannot tell family. But guess who you can tell? You can tell a priest. So this is how I got involved in this, and I'm glad that we were able to be like, hello, this is not, they are really hurting you. She calls me and says, hey, I need to talk to a priest. To which I'm like, what are you talking, because we don't talk that way. And she says, well, no, no, they said I couldn't tell anyone, but I can talk to a priest, which marks the pastor, so that's the same thing. Which then led to a call conversation that reveals that this is not good, right? But, I, and I, I know, that's goofy. I mean, but I, like I said before, deception, darkness is dark. And, and I don't apologize for it, but when God talks to me, it always goes deep and it's heavy, so welcome to class today. Because he told me today what he has taught me about things to share with you in a way that hopefully it will apply to your learning styles. I don't know if I'm your learning style, but this is all you get. So, like when you think about darkness, that's just a goofy example, but you think there are places where people are sitting in dark rooms right now trying to figure out how to kill people. There are things that have happened in your life that are horrible. Pornography is everywhere. 
And I don't say that to shame anybody in the room or online, but let's be honest. If I had everybody in this room stand up who has dealt with it, who struggles with it, or who has messed with their lives, it would be over half the room. Darkness is everywhere and it destroys us. The enemy is nasty. There's molestation, sexual, it's just, there's so much icky stuff and fraud and things have been taken from you and you are mourning and grieving a loss. Some of you are dealing with sickness or fear that it could be a sickness or you don't know where you're getting, I mean, darkness is nasty. And I think for the longest time, well, I'll just say this. When I was really praying about this, I felt like God said to me, Jerry, you have no idea how dark darkness is. Like I know that Jesus came. I know he came to save me from my sin because sin is dark and I know that he wants to give us life. But I felt like God was saying, sweetie, you don't have a clue how evil evil is. You do not know how dark dark is. I mean, I hear about the dark net and I'm like, oh my yeah. That there's just people that literally that's all they do is sit and, hi, can I steal your money? Like what? But it's real. Darkness is real. And it's a little overwhelming when those things I listed and the anger and the fear and the loss and the, the worry and the anxiety and what we feel, the anger that takes over that makes us want to just rip someone's head off and we're like, wow, that was nasty. That's just the tip of the iceberg of why Jesus died. He knows how bad it is. He knows. Anyway, so he told me that. And this is the, the part that I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus. He said, but Jerry, like that's this end of the spectrum, right? I have to stand up, I guess. That's this end of the spectrum. But then he said, Jerry, you have no idea how light I am, how powerful I am, how strong I am, how actually more powerful than that I am. Do you know what I mean? And I thought, oh, that really helps me because sometimes we can get so focused on the power of that, what that could mean, what could happen if this is happening and then that happens and oh my gosh, and he literally, I was like, yeah, you're right. Because like, you don't have a clue, Jerry. Not my fault. But you don't know how big I am. And I don't know that I'll ever know until I get to heaven and go, dang. I literally told Grace, I said, I want to shut everything down in here and close the blinds so we can be in darkness. And then I want to turn to those big lights there, blinding, right? And it would give us a small taste of how his light permeates darkness to the point that we would be blind. Oh, Paul wrote this book and he got blind from the light. That's a good illustration. Anyway, I want you to know it's dark, but I also want to challenge me and you because I'm not kidding, our lives and what we go through even just the last week or two, I, I need to know that you hear me say that it's, yeah, it's hard, but we cannot be afraid of the dark. We can't. And amidst all the pain and the evil and the slander, we can have defiant joy. Now, frankly, I've got an almost nine-year-old who's learning what that word means because she's learned this stance and this stance and little eyes, beady little eyes, and that's defiant. That's exactly what defiant joy is. It's like, despite all this, I will have joy because of who God is and how big he is. So that's what we've been talking about. That's what the sermon series has been. It's like defiant joy. And I want you to grab, that's like, in your face, I will not, I will not let the enemy steal my joy. Even if we don't feel it, I will not let him steal it. He is brighter and bigger than we think. Defiant means bold, obstinate, and res res resistant, like pushback. I'm going to have to pray right now. Y'all, that's okay with that? Before I get out of control? All right, Jesus, I know you're here, and I know your spirit is here, and all power that is in heaven and earth, you are in control. We just surrender the things in our lives that bug us, that annoy us, that overwhelm us, that just rip us to shreds on the inside. God, even those, those sins and, the, and how we dance with the darkness and rationalize it and, and, and even put it in a compartment so we don't even have to realize it's happening. You know, and God, I am so, so grateful for me and for everyone else here and online and listening wherever. None of it surprises you. And you adore us and you love us, and your whole heart is that we can know that and be free and get above it all and like live the way that you died to have us live. I thank you for that so much. God, take my tongue, take all of this stuff, and may you translate it, and may it speak to who you are and the truth of what you've done for us and how we can actually have tools to help us to actually do it and believe it. 
And I just pray that in Jesus' name, amen. All right, this is going to be, a, I'm, a, I'm trying to do this like laid back for me instead of this. You don't know that I do this, but I'm like, hey, it's a big church. It's a lot of pressure. But I'm going to do this like I would do this in a small group. Okay, I've got four words for you because there's four things that you are going to learn today that will help you have like that, that stubborn, this is them, that stubborn joy. M make, work, do, hold. Say it with me. Make, work, do, hold. For those of you that are like, oh, I hate when people do that, I'm like, I do too. I don't like for anyone to be up here telling me what to do, and I usually don't do it. So those of you who did it, great. If you didn't, I don't care. So make, work, do, hold. Say it again. Make, work, do, hold. Y'all are make, y'all are work, y'all are do, y'all are hold. Say it again. Make, work, do, hold. I hope those mean something to you in about 25 minutes. <laughs> Those are the four things. Those are the four things we're going to learn. Um, so these are the points. No, I won't do that first. I want to review because I, all the stuff that we've kind of talked about. The book of Philippians is where we are. It's written by a man named Paul who's in prison probably about 30 years after Jesus died and resurrected. That sets the context. Um, he's writing to a church that's in, it's called, it's in, in the town of Philippi. It's a letter, hence it's called Philippians, Philippi. Um, it's under Roman control. If you were to try to find Philippi now, it would be in northern Greece. It's up at the top of Greece. It was a commercial center of major activity. It was very diverse in who lived there, and it was mostly Gentiles, which means it was mostly people like us. There weren't a lot of Jews there. It was mostly people from other parts of the world all coming together in that spot. It was a hopping, hopping town. And so he's writing to them, and the whole book, he's like, Joy, joy, you can have joy, you can have joy, you can have joy, you can have joy. <clears throat> Let me show you the points to joy, play on word. These things are the sermons we've had so far. One, stand firm in joy amidst languishing, first week. Second week, be confident in God's power, purpose, and plan. Third week, trust in God's grace and freely give it away. These things can lead us to joy. Number four, put your love in the correct order and make Christ known. Number five, be like-minded and be unified in Christ as followers of Jesus. Number six, empty yourself. That was last week, and this week is trust the process. So I'm going to read to you Philippians 2. I'm going to steal a little bit about what Mark talked about at the beginning because I think it ties in. Because those four things, the, wor the make, work, do, hold, is what I'm going to talk about today. So the first one is make. And so let me read that first part that kind of reviews what he talked about last week. Chapter 2 starts, and he basically says, if you have any benefit from knowing Jesus, please be like-minded. You'll give me joy if you do. And then he says in verse 5, make your attitude Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, last week's sermon, he emptied himself by assuming a form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men, and when he'd come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." And then it says that God then, because of Jesus' obedience, it says, and um, he made him, um, Jesus is Lord, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Like he made him above everything because of his obedience. So I do want to preface this by saying this. Um, you know, people sit up here and throw Greek words at you. It is not because I know Greek words. It's, I know Alpha and Omega, but it's because of a thing that I want to give you as a tool. It's called blueletterbible.org. Some of you may already use it. Blueletterbible.org is that website, and what you do is you go there. You can look up any verse in the Bible, any translation you want, and it will tell you what the original Old Testament Hebrew is or the New Testament Greek, what the meaning of all those different words actually is, like all the breakdown fascinating. So I'm telling you that because as I read through this passage, I use that a lot because I'm like, what does that mean? So just so you know, make means like make, like you have to, you have to make your own attitude that of Jesus. And this is repeating from last week, but the reality is that you make your attitude like Christ, like you know that you're a child of God. Mark talked last week about who was it? Like Hercules? His daddy's a god, and he's a human, so he's a demigod. And if you watch Moana, I would love to sing that for you, but that's not appropriate right now. So, we be, so at, when you meet Jesus, when you invite him in your life and you get filled with his spirit, 
you, you have a father that's a God. It's amazing. And to remember that, like to have your mind focused on that, right? And then he says Jesus became like a slave, which means a couple things. It means he could have no expectations of others to fulfill in his life. That in and of itself for me is like, dang it, that's hard. To have no expectations of other people or of circumstances or experiences. That means you come to church and you're like, God, whatever. Whatever happens, I'm good. You go to work and you're like, God, no one owes me anything. I'm a slave to you. That's tough. It also means you choose not to be offendable, which frankly you have to make, we have to make ourselves not be offendable. You have to make that attitude of Christ. And then I've got, he's obedient. Like we have to make ourselves obey God to the point of even dying to ourselves, which is obviously biblical, right? And the cool thing is when Paul writes like these things, if you've ever read any of Paul's letters, first of all, it's like, therefore, because of, you have to read the whole letter like starting from the beginning, but he always is like, this is what I want to tell you. This is how you do it. And this is why you do it. So I'm going to give you a little bit of that today as we literally read through this portion of scripture. But it's, it's nice to know that when we make our mind um, that of Christ, when we start thinking like Jesus, when we put ourselves in the right perspective, then the reason doing that is then we can actually fulfill what God created us to do and to be. Because Jesus did. And Jesus is Lord and he's got the name above all names. But it's true for us that God will do in through us what he called us to do. That's the why of why to do it. All right. Are you ready? Because that was the first one is what? Make. Like make it, make it. I'm try I was trying to think of hand motions. Like this is make, right? Make, 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 something like that. Make. I want you to remember this. And I don't care if I make a fool of myself. Make, make. you got to remember this. So the first thing, if we want to have defiant joy, if we want to rise above the darkness and be like, I'm actually liking life even though it's really hard, you make yourself have the attitude of Jesus. Number two, let me read this chunk to you because this is my assignment for today, 12 through 18. You ready? So then, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who's working in you, enabling you both to desire and to work out his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God, who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, among whom you shine like stars in the world. Hold firmly to the message of life, then I can boast on the day of Christ that I didn't run and labor for nothing. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. And in the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Now, I don't know how you read the Bible, but when I read that, I'm, I'm always like, that was a lot of words. So I'm going to break it down for you so we can, can we, we can eat it up together. Okay, so work out your own salvation. That word work is a word that me, that, does I have it up there? Look at that fun Greek word. There it is. And it means to accomplish, finish, fashion, bring about. It means to accomplish, to finish, to fashion, and bring about. It does not say work for your salvation. I don't know if you know that or not. or if, what, It doesn't say work for your salvation. It doesn't say work so you can get salvation. Bottom line is Jesus died on the cross for your sin. He covers all that darkness, brings light into it, fills them with your spirit. You are a new creation. And then he says, you, we spend the rest of our life working to bring about the ability to live that. So let's say I was raised in a home over here, and I'm like 20 years old, 30 years old, living a certain way. And then I find out, wait a minute, I was adopted. I'm actually the king's daughter. So I'm now a princess. Well, if I was raised in this environment... And I find out I'm a princess, I, it's going to take a long time to, to relearn things, to figure out what that means, to function in that freedom, to have that, you know what I'm saying? And so basically, that's what work out your salvation means. You already have life, but there's a lot of things that have to die and get pruned in order for you to actually experience the life he died to give you. It's your salvation too. Don't care about Fred or Sue or Patricia or Emmanuel. It's your salvation. Work out yours. Don't meddle with everybody else's. You work out your personal relationship with Jesus. And it is a process. It is a lifelong journey. So that's the first one is you work out your salvation. And I told you Paul is like a little teacher. So he says, how do you do that, you ask? And then he says, with fear and trembling. Now, that doesn't make any sense to me. So that means I'm supposed to help God transform me into who he called me to be and be scared all the time. 
Shake, trembling literally means shaking in your boots. Like shake, it means, <laughs> there's no fancy Greek words for fear and trembling. It just means fear and trembling. And as I was praying about it, I, there were two things I thought, or I felt like God told me, like, the first one is this. It, brought, it reminded me of a story I'll share with you about me and my spouse. So I had dated a couple different people that like date, I use the word dated loosely. They probably didn't like me like I like them, but they broke my heart. And so by the time you're <clears throat> 32 and you're still single, you're just kind of like, I'm, I'm a big lock box. You're not, no one's getting in, right? But you still want to be loved. And I remember Mark and I, Washington State, we, were, we were, started hanging out, both youth, pa- youth pastors from different churches, and we were kind of hanging out together, like adult companionship because we were around teenagers all the time. And so we were hanging out, and it was good. And it was the first relationship I had that I liked him as a person, and I didn't want anything else. Oh, good. He's not hurting me. This is good. In fact, I had said, this is good. I don't even need to know what you, nothing. You don't need to define this thing. I'm good, right? I was washing clothes in Coopville, Washington by my washer and dryer, which is where you typically wash clothes. And I will never forget, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to do it all for you, but I'm standing there and it was like, I was praying, talking to God about something. And it was like he gave me a glimpse of what he was going to do with this Mark Chester person in my life. And I sh- should have been like, that is awesome. been praying for years. But instead, full-on panic attack. I mean, I remember being like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. And I slid down the wall, and I start crying because it would, if that's what he was doing, first of all, that's powerful, and it would demand things changed. It would demand I had no control. It, was, it scared the crud out of me, and I was shaking in my boots. Was it bad? No. But it would start a process of surrender from me to let him in. That's what it means to work out. Your, your salvation with fear and trembling. It's the reality that, guess what? It's a big deal. It's a big, big deal. And here's why it's a big deal. He says, Paul says, if you can track with me, for it is God working in you to do his good and purpose. Do you get that? Like the creator of the universe is literally inside of me tinkering around all the time. That should make me a little bit like, ooh, this is a big deal. Maybe I should take it seriously. God knows how dark the dark is, so therefore he wants me to not be entrapped by it. He wants you to not be trapped by it. So it's like, wowzba, God is actually working in me. And it says to desire and work out his good purpose. To desire means like to bring about a delight in me so that I'm actually with him and I'm not fighting him all the time. And work out is a word, energio, energy that is his good purpose his good purpose he's not a bad god he's not trying to make you do whatever you don't want to do he's a good god and he has good delightful kind things he wants to do in our lives so you want to review with me so the first one is which one make that's good because i forgot the second one work out your salvation with fear and trembling because god's got it number three do everything without grumbling and arguing Okay, now when I've always read this verse my whole life, that makes sense to me. Sure, stop complaining. Stop complaining. But when I looked up these delightful Greek words for grumbling and arguing, I was like, is that not like what I think it means? That means something different, okay? They're fun words. That's why I wrote them up here. Look at that. Okay, I'm going to say it here. Gongos mousse. I'm saying it like I'm Italian. Gongos mousse or whatever. Dialogismas. Does that look like dialogue at all? Dialogismas. Someone who knows poor Greek is dying that I'm up here and have the right to do this. Um, So he says, do everything without grumbling, complaining. Grumbling means to murmur, secret debate, not stating publicly. We know that. Oh, that's stupid. It's not intended for people to hear. It's under our breath like... And Mark, what did he say it was called? What is that word? Onomatopoeia? Onomatopoeia means a word that sounds like it is, like swoosh. Or, or all the Batman movies, bang, whap. Um, so it's like an onomatopoeia, but he had a Greek word. It's an onomana something. That that's what that is. To murmur is to murmur, 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 right? And then the other one means internal discussion, imagination, internal thought, doubting, and dispute. And here's where my brain goes. Well, then how is that what I'm thinking it is if all that's internal? 
And then I'm like, wait a minute, it says do everything without grumbling and arguing. What's everything? I can say it's everything, but what is everything? Well, we just read that God is working in me to will and desire his good purpose. Huh. So that might mean that do everything that God is asking us to do without, I don't want to, I don't trust you, you're a mean God. Does that make sense? He's, I feel like Paul's saying, oh, he's trustworthy. Just do what he says without grumbling and complaining and arguing with him. Because here's what happens. The more I do that with him, and the more I'm like cynical and frustrated, and it says internal thought, discussion, doubting, dispute, debates. Like it's all this inner dialogue of frustration. and conf- The more I do that with him, guess where I will then do it? Then I will murmur against y'all. And I will question as if I'm watching a reality show and I'm just... Dis- Part, not part of it. So why does he say not to do that? So we may be blameless and pure, pure meaning without a mix of evil, like harmless. Um, I feel like I'm dating myself. Edward Scissorhands, anyone know who that is? He like literally had scissors on his hands so that we will not be like that, cutting and hurting each other. So we will literally be blameless and pure in our homes, at work, out and about, on the highway, wherever it would be, that we would be blameless and pure. Children of God, which Pastor Mark talked about last week, that we literally will be who we're created to be, faultless, check this out, in a crooked, perverted generation among who you shine like stars in the world. There's a whole lot of stuff there. That word crooked means warped and winding, like it's out of alignment, right? A crooked world. Perverted means distorted, corrupt, Oppose, turn aside from right. Now, it doesn't, I don't have to give you examples. I could do a whole PowerPoint of how crooked and warped and perverted our world is, yeah? I didn't, so I don't have one. But I figure you've got enough in your head and you've seen enough in your life and experienced enough to be like, that is the truth. But here's the cool part. He says that if you will do what I say without grumbling and arguing, you will actually become function like a child of mine, and then you will be a bright shining light amongst all the cray cray around you. I think that's a great reason. We are bright light when we choose not to grumble and argue with God. We're like stars. But I want to talk about the other part, and we'll talk about it more in a little bit, but the crooked and perverted generation, the world, and we kind of touched on that. It really is dark, if I'll just pause for It's dark, right? <clears throat> But it's like sometimes, I mean, I catch myself doing it, and I know we all do it, like, oh, my gosh, can you believe that happened? What? What? And I feel like Jesus is like, in this world, you will have trouble. Like, it's a fact. It's dark. It's horrible. Like, we can't be surprised by it as much as we deal with it. Because I don't think when he said you will have trouble, it will mean like you got a toenail, that ingrown toenail or something. I mean, I think Jesus, from his perspective, is like, oh, no. It's going to get hard and bad, but don't you worry, because I have overcome all of that, right? But we cannot, one, focus on the dark, and we cannot be afraid of it, like I said before. Um, And I wrote this down, because it's true for me. I wrote this in my journal earlier this week. It is too easy to be, for me to be, and maybe you, drawn in, pay attention to, Oh, be overwhelmed by, be manipulated by, or intrigued sometimes by darkness. Oh, I'll just check one more time what's happening. Or, oh, this hurts, but I'm going to stay here because at least it's comfort. We just get intrigued, and it's like it's like a circus act that we can't take our eyes away from. And God's like, no, you cannot focus on it. Because when you're focused on all the icky stuff, you're going to be overwhelmed by it. I get overwhelmed by it, and you have to choose to step back. We only see what we're looking for. Have you ever experienced that? We only see what we're looking for, okay, in life and in people. And here's the deal. Like, I, Mark will tell you this, and he's probably talked about it up here, that if, I, if he says, Jerry, pick me up at this car dealership or wherever, I am looking only for the car dealership. And it has happened more than once where he decided he'd help me out with his ADD-ness and walk closer to me. And he's like, how did you not see me flailing my arms on the side of the road? Because I am way back there. And I'm like, because I wasn't looking for you. I don't know how I do that. 
I, did, I do it at the grocery store all the time. I'm looking for grocery stuff, not people. So do not, please don't be offended if I don't say hi to you. It's not you, it's me. So we only see what we're looking for. And it was a funny example. I took, um, I took uh, Ashton and I went, my, our youngest daughter, to a walk with our dog. And she decided, uh, Culp's Hill, three point something miles, she took her hoverboard. Hoverboards don't last that long. Anyway, she's on her little hoverboard. She does it really good. And of course, you get to a place and she's like, eh, beep, 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 beep. It doesn't work anymore. So I'm like, let's hide it by a tree and then we'll just drive back and get it later. Because she's like, oh, it's going to be really heavy to carry, mommy. I'm like, well, you don't have to carry it. And this is my daughter. We hit it by a tree and she says, but what if someone sees it and takes it? It's not safe there. Mommy, how, did someone take it? Are you sure it's safe? And I found myself saying this to her, like, we only see what we're looking for, honey, and nobody is at Culp's Hill looking for a, a hoverboard under a tree. So nobody's going to see it. Here's a picture of it. Because you cannot, you only, we only see what we're looking for. Can you see a hoverboard? Any hoverboards there? No hoverboard. Because we only see what we're looking for. And if you show the next one, I don't even know if you can still see the hoverboard. It's like right under the tree. Can you see it yet? Right. You're not looking for a hoverboard, but it was there. And, and the reality struck me, our focus determines our perspective. You can write that down if you want, because that's really good for me. <laughs> like God said to me this week, what you're focused on determines your perspective. And if I am focused on all the dark, icky, bad, painful stuff, that is how I'm going to live my life. That will be my perspective. And hear me, it is nowhere more true than with people. If, I, if you are focused on the sin part of Jerry, guess what? It's not hard to find because we all have it. We're all a hot mess. We all have sin in our lives. And so I really feel like Paul's saying what God wants to say to us, like, you have to focus on me because you will get sucked into the darkness and it will warp your perception of things. And then you will do things and say things and act in ways towards people and circumstances that could literally be a little crazy because you're now basing it off all that's not, that's bad. Do you know what I'm saying? That's my little warning to you. Um, got it? We only see what we're looking for. And then I wrote this down. If we're not looking at Jesus, we easily placate to looking at the darkness. It says our enemy is like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, and he's also called the accuser. He will point out the things in a circumstance or in people that prove they are less than what they should be, especially concerning us. And they're not what we deserve. We deserve more. And it will detract us, and it will steal our joy. So, all right, what is it again? What's the first one? Because <laughs> I don't remember. Okay, so it's make, and then it's work have I wait oh you're good I haven't even gotten that far yet okay so which one were we on do we're on do right we're on the do okay so it's um instead of murmuring in the dark we need to look towards the light talk honestly with God and worship him it doesn't mean you have to pretend all the horrible stuff in our lives because I know in this room and online like someone is wanting to commit suicide right now right it doesn't mean that you go, oh, life is good. I'm not miserable. I'm ha you literally bring it to God and you get in the light and you say, help me. Because darkness is real. But he's like, but I'm bigger and I'm stronger. So instead of murmuring and fighting God on all the things he gives to give us life, just start being obedient. It says in Philippians 4, 8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, Whatever's right and pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about that stuff. I had to do that this week. I have to do it all the time. But because I was doing this, I was like, oh, I want to camp out right here. And yet you're like, nope. You think about what is good. You think about the fact that you're spending quality time with your daughter. You think about this. You look and see the blessings and the gifts and where I am working, where you do see me. And, you will and I did. It was like the little... Um, thing that you, the claw that comes down and takes the stuffed animals that no one wins, you know, and plucks them and you win. Well, I feel like God will take, when we're obedient to him, he comes down and he does get us and he pulls us up out of it and then he freezes and you can literally feel it inside. I love it. This is funny. So I was, a, <laughs> went to Walmart the other day. You know how our Walmart, thanks to COVID, now has music on the outside? <laughs> so you're going to Walmart and you're like, I'm feeling good. It's like a dance party out here in the parking lot. 
Well, for some reason, there was no music, but this is what I heard, a very calm voice over the loudspeaker, and the entire Walmart parking lot says this, where your attention goes, your energy flows. Are you feeling depleted and angry? <laughs> I was like, what is that? But it's true. I was like, I'm going to write it down. Because that's true. Where your attention goes, that is where your energy will go. You hate somebody, if you focus on that hate, all the energy in your life is going to be focused towards me, right? It's just true. Are you feeling depleted and angry? I'm like, I don't know where this is going, but I got to go shopping. Oh, that was funny. So don't focus on the darkness. All right, number four, the last one. So we have make, work, do. Number four is hold firmly to the message of life. Hold firmly means pay attention. What's the message of life? I don't know. I'll look it up on Blue Letter Bible. It means it's the gospel. It's the logos. It's the word of God that is Jesus is God in human form. And he came to our planet. He saw every bit of despicable nastiness in all of us. And he said, while you were yet sinners, I'm going to be obedient enough to die for you so that my blood covers your sin. So that when you repent and you come to me and agree with me that you're filthy nasty, then you can realize how much I love you and you're beautiful and perfect. And I will walk with you to work out that salvation process your whole life so you don't have to feel less than, alone, or stupid, or unwanted, or unworthy. That is good stuff. Did I articulate that good enough? I felt like that came out pretty good. Um, but he says, pay attention to the word, the message of life, the G Jesus, the truths, the promises. This book, I promise, it's scary when you first start because it's like Chinese. The more you read it, the more you ask God to tell you about it, the smaller it becomes, and it's delightful. It's delightful. And the faith that you can exercise. Why hold firmly to all that stuff? Paul has a reason. He says... Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. You got a man in prison who's writing the church in Philippi. And he's like, if you guys can make your attitude like Jesus. And if you can continue to trust God enough to work out what he died for you in you. And if you can do what he's telling you to do without like fighting him the entire way. If you can hold to all these truths, I'll know it's worth it. And when I get to heaven, and after running, if you're a runner, yeah, you, I used to be, it's hard. It's like a mental discipline. He says, when I, when I, am, I didn't run, work in that direction, or labor, if you've ever had a child, need I say more? It's painful, but it's an investment in life. And he's like, then I can boast when I see Jesus that I did not do this in vain. I didn't proclaim all these truths in vain. I, that, like, that's just joy for him. And then he says at the very end, if you remember, it's now in real time. He's like, real time, I'm in prison. But even if I'm poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, like right now, even if I die in loving you and looking at how you're doing, I'm glad and I rejoice with all of you. And in the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. There is nothing more powerful and life-giving than when followers of Jesus choose to follow him together, to trust him and obey him together. It creates a sweet, safe, deep connection that nothing on the planet does. This depth of satisfaction. It's why he created the church. It's why we do groups. It's why we do life groups. Because this isn't going to cut it, right? But, but he's like, because if you do this, it makes me so full of joy. And he's like, and I'm in jail, but you, I want you to feel so much joy because I'm exactly where God wants me to be. Like that exchange of joy because of the, the desire to do this. It doesn't mean, oh, I get joy if you're perfect. It means, man, if we're in this together, if we can do this together, it will literally from the inside out create this joy that we can't even imagine. All right. I created a little graph. And if it's for one of you, I'm so excited because I created it for me and I'm sharing it with you. This is how I remember this. Isn't it pretty? So, thank you. Um, it says, make your attitude like Jesus, work out your own salvation, do everything without grumbling and hold firm to the message of life. And then, then you can experience joy. That little QR code that Joe made for me, thank you, Joe, it, it t takes you to our digital bulletin. So if you want a copy of my delightful little graph I made, it is yours to have. 
I might make a sticker for myself and stick it on my laptop because I have to remember. I have to remember those things. So what are they again? Oh, I want you to know this so bad. All right. You can leave that up there a little bit. So we're going to do communion together. And if anyone needs the elements, Dan and others are going to come forward and they will give them to you. I got a two-pack today, so I will use my second pack. Um, and I want to talk about something really quick. Remember, we, we talked about the darkness and this, this, we shine like stars in this world that's full of crooked and perverted, this whole crooked and perverted generation, right? Here's the kicker. That's us. <laughs> Don't ever hear me say it. If someone took this out of context, what I said before, they would miss the whole point. Because we can easily, as the church or as followers of Jesus, be like, the world is such a mess. Hey, you're in here. I'm in here. It's us. We are that crooked and perverted generation. And but for Jesus, we would be just as messed up without hope. Now, frankly, sometimes I'm just as messed up. But I do know that Jesus is there, so it doesn't take me, derail me too bad, right? It's why Jesus came in the, why God came in the form of a man and why he died for us. Um, and so communion's a cool thing because it's an opportunity to come clean before God and repent. Like repentance. Repentance is simply this. Yep. That part of me is pretty dark, God. That part of me, look, the blinds are going down. It, but repentance is saying, I'll just, yeah, I want to do this. Like repentance is saying, yes, I cannot stop doing pornography. I can't, God. I try and I can't. Repentance is, I have such an anger problem and I'm a jerk, but I really do love my family. Repentance is saying, I can't stop drinking. Repentance is saying, God, I worry all the time. And you say not to worry, but I do. Repentance is saying, I'm so angry that I could just spit and beat someone up. And I don't want to be. Repentance is agreeing with God of the darkness that's in our lives. And the cool thing about our God is he says, yep, I already know. Come here, kiddo. I love you so much. And I want to tell you that I covered it already. Makes me tear up because I don't even know what I look like the way he sees me. I'm pretty darn good. I'll be like, dang, look at me. I won't even see that person till heaven. But when he looks at you, despite your darkness and the things you're stuck in and the choices and the hurt and even the anger you have towards him, he doesn't go, oh, no. He's like, I know, kiddo. Come here. Let's talk about it. And so when you do communion, you come to him and say, yes, that's true. That is true, God, and I'm so sorry. And then you can pick your head up and say, but thank you, Jesus, that you covered it all, and I'm a hot mess, but you're my dad, and you covered it, and I really do want to work out what you died to give me. I really, really do. And you thank him for dying for you physically, and you thank him for the fact that his blood covers all your sin, and then you're doing it together with him. And then the enemy can't manipulate you. Mm. I'm going to tell a little thing, because I said last service, I don't know if this fits with what I'm talking about, and then someone said, dang it. I wondered why you were going to share it, and then it was for me. So, so the other day, um, my oldest, Nathan, he wants a four-wheeler, if anyone has one. We have a half an acre. I'm sure he'll have a blast on it. Um, he wants a four-wheeler so bad. We're in central PA, so he mows the lawn a lot and thinks it's the bomb. And so what does he do on it? He puts his little earbuds in, and he's listening. He's got some worship music on his little whatever it is, and he's got some Mario Kart songs and stuff. But he's listening to Predominant. It's all good stuff. And so he's mowing the lawn. I need to tell him something. So I get out, and I'm like, eh, eh. so he drives his little lawnmower up, and he gets right next to me, and he's got his earbuds in, and the lawnmower's on, and me and my pride, I'm like, Nathan, and this is what he's doing. <laughs> and I'm like, mm-mm, I'll wait, you little stinker. <laughs> but here's the reality. What he's listening to is good. Especially if it's worship music, right? He's doing what he's supposed to do because he's mowing the lawn and that's his job. So he's doing what he's supposed to do and he's listening to worship music. And his mother's presence is right in front of him. Guess what? He cannot hear me. And it's not because, which in some cases it is, that there's darkness in us. Sometimes, honestly, guys, we can't hear the Lord because everything's so noisy in our life. 
with good stuff. So for those of you who have been sitting here and enduring what I have to say for like however long it's been, that maybe this is for you. Maybe there's things that are good in your life, but they're actually preventing you from actually hearing God. And so when I challenge myself and I challenge you all, hey, when you bow your head and you have to repent, if you're not sure, say, Jesus, is there stuff that's preventing me from hearing you? Because that little kid on that, what, what are you saying? And I'm like, I'll just wait. Because I have something to say to you and you are so all doing other things. And so if you're doing the right things and you're reading your Bible and you're mowing your lawn, maybe you need to turn off the lawn mower. Maybe you need to unplug from all the stuff that helps you be a better Christian and actually just listen to the God that you're serving anyway. So I don't know if that's for anybody, but we do this. I don't want you to miss the fact that this is for all of us because we're all kind of in the same boat. Are you ready? This is your opportunity. I don't want you to miss it. I've lost my cracker. I know, there's two down here. Like I've got, oh, and it broke in half. I already broke it. Um, so get your elements. I'm sorry that's taken so long. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. This is Paul talking in Corinthians. I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it already done and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me that when we break bread when we do this I laugh because it's a carb and I've said this before and Mark said that I say this we eat this all the time but if at th in that context it was the Passover and he's like this bread that you eat for the Passover I'm breaking it and when you break it you remember that's now me I came I have a real body and I'm gonna die so that you can have life so what we're going to do right now is I want you to bow your head. I'm going to give you a moment to just thank him for doing it and acknowledge that he did it because that's all we have to do. And then I'll pray for us, okay? God, your kids all over the place, even in this moment and even in the middle of the week when someone listens to this. We're acknowledging that we know what you've done for us. Even if we don't believe it or we're mad at you, it's irrelevant. You did it and we're acknowledging it before you. That we remember, God, that you came and, and, and that love is so much more than what we think it is. It is literally dying to ourselves for the benefit of someone else. And Jesus, you did that for us. So thank you. Thank you. So you can take the bread now. All right. And in the same way, after supper, which is how they say dinner in England, after supper, he also took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant established by my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It says new covenant because the Old Testament was the law. And now Jesus is like, now my blood is the ultimate sacrifice. Where you used to have to sacrifice animals and sprinkle their blood on the altar, I'm sacrificing my life. And this blood is gonna cover all your sin. It's such a cool thing, such an amazing thing. And so he's like, when you do this, realize that you are a sinner and then realize my grace covers all that sin and it's that, inner, that repentance and then realization, realization that is really what it means um, to do communion. So we're gonna take a few minutes to repent. This is you and Jesus, right where you are, right where you are. And to repent, to, to agree with God concerning a sin but don't get stuck there because darkness will quickly take over. Then he's looking you right in the eyes saying, I love you and I have died for you. So take that moment right now and I'm gonna give you a couple more minutes and I myself and, 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 and acknowledge how and thank him and repent in front of him.
God, none of this surprises you. I think it makes your heart warm, just like if one of my kids would finally admit something they did wrong, and I could be like, thank you. And then you set us free. So Jesus, as we drink this cup and remember what you've done, may it make a difference in how we live. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for grace that's ridiculous. May we walk in confidence in who you've called us to be. Help us to remember these tools that we can use to step outside of what is darkness and live in the light that you created. May we, may we look at people through your eyes. May we look at circumstances through your eyes. May you pluck us up out of what overwhelms us and free us. And may we really, really choose to work on our salvation and die to ourselves so that we can experience really real, real life. I just thank you, God, for shedding your blood. Amen. You guys claim that. Sometimes we do communion real solemn, and that's really great, but it is a pretty stinking cool deal that he's done that for us, and so we celebrate that. We are free because he did that. So the worship team is going to lead us in a song, and there will be people afterwards that if you can come up or during the song, if you want to do something more official, if you're not done talking to him, or if you want to pray with someone else or whatever you want to do, don't miss this. I know we all got lunch and we're going home, but if there's something that you need to seal with the Lord before you go, make sure to do it. And especially if you're sitting here or you're online and you don't yet have a personal relationship with this Jesus I'm talking about, don't be embarrassed. It's just know where you are. You can online, you can click on the things that they say you can click on on our website. And if you're here, you can come forward and we want to talk with you. We want to pray with you. We really want to journey with you on your personal relationship with Jesus, all right?